Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my interview with Bruce Bastian, my recent interview with Bruce Bastian. Of course, 10 years ago, around 2010, I interviewed Bruce, Bruce Bastian, philanthropist, founder of WordPerfect, uh, someone who's been instrumental in the fight for LGBT rights in Utah and, ac and across the country, but also someone who formed one of the most important companies in my life and in the history of tech, WordPerfect Corporation, that ended up being purchased by Novell. Uh, you can listen to all that in the previous episode and in the interview I did 10 years ago with Bruce. Uh, I'm John DeLynn. We just spent uh, some time with Bruce talking about his life since 2010 and specifically focusing around his philanthropy and even more specifically his philanthropy with HRC, the Human Rights Commission, and all that they did uh, in response to Prop 8 that ultimately led to the legalization of same-sex marriage in the United States nationwide by 2015, and some really good uh, human rights legislation, uh, LGBT-affirming legislation here in the state of Utah. So much good has happened, and uh, Bruce has been such an important part of uh, this state and this country, and of improving the lives of you know five percent of us basically here in the in, in the United States and in the world. So it was super fun to catch up with Bruce, but I'm way more excited even so about what you are about to hear today. So when Bruce Bastian, uh, you know, came out as, as a gay man, left the LDS Church, uh, was divorced from his wife, and and lived uh, his life for a few decades. You know, as we talked about last time, Bruce maybe at some point got a little bit disillusioned about relationships and about what his future might, might be in terms of love and companionship <clears throat> and relationships. And little did Bruce know that when he was fighting for uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage, uh, that, that those efforts were going to actually yield important benefits in his own life. So without any further ado, I want to uh, turn your attention back to Bruce and a new special guest on Mormon Stories podcast. We have Clint Ford joining us mm -hmm. today uh, to round out this interview. Clint Ford, welcome to Mormon mm -hmm. Stories podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so good to have you. And uh, you figure into Bruce's story why? Bruce's story why? Um, I think, <laughs> uh, well, obviously we're married, so I'm yeah. part of the story. Um, <laughs> And that's something important that's happened since 2010, yeah, right? Yeah, since 2010, yeah. Probably yeah. one of the most important things that's happened, yeah. Yeah. So we are going to dig into how in the world did this happen that, that 10 years after Bruce was kind of worn out and disillusioned with relationships, he now sits before us today, a married man having benefited from uh, the legislation and the legal status that was afforded to all LGBT people. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk about their love story. But what that means, Clint, is that we have to start backing up and learn a little bit about you. Okay. All right. So take us back to your, you know, um, childhood. I was, I was born and raised um, in Bountiful, Utah. Uh, the first part of my childhood was spent in Woods Cross. Then we moved um, to Bountiful when I was 15. Um, I mean, other than that, I mean, my childhood was great. My parents are great. They're both... Um, we were raised in the Mormon church. How many siblings? I'm the youngest of four. I have okay. two older brothers and a sister. Um, I have like nine, niece, nine nieces and nephews. And um, we're all pretty close. We're, in a way, we're all pretty close. Um, I, after... Real, real quick. Shoot, I'm getting lost. Uh, okay. No, it's good. Our listeners won't really... For the people outside of Utah, they will not have no idea what Bountiful is even like. Yeah. Can we paint a... Because I would say there are a few really intense... Mormon areas in Utah. Bountiful and Certainly Orem. Provo and Orem, <laughs> where, where Bruce spent a lot of his time. Certainly Draper and Sandy. Certainly Alpine and Highland. You know, Logan, Cache Valley can be pretty intense. But I would say Bountiful's pretty top five yeah. in terms of, you know, a lot of the, you know, apostles, Mormon apostles have, have lived in Bountiful. I know mm -hmm. Jeffrey R. Holland raised his kids in Bountiful. A lot of the LDS apostles traditionally have lived in North Salt Lake, Mm -hmm. More in Bountiful. Mm -hmm. And it's just known as a pretty intense area to, to grow up Mormon. So talk about what Bountiful is like, and then talk about, Clint, what it was like to grow up as someone who knew he was gay in heavily conservative Mormon Bountiful, Bountiful. Utah. Okay, all right. 
Um, I mean, obviously at a young age, I was aware that there was something going on with me that wasn't similar with all the other boys um, that I would play with as a child. Um, and as I got older, I, I started realizing what, what that was. I was obviously gay. Um, in Bountiful, Woods Cross area, it's a very conservative city. I mean, everything basically is, when I was younger, was closed on Sunday. Like all the, we didn't have a Walmart. We had a Smith's and a Dick's Market and a Weiniger's and Dick's and Weiniger's closed every Sunday. And um, so it's very, very conservative. Uh, they don't want you to work on Sunday. You would go to church and then spend the rest of the day with your family. Um, but And you're in the shadow of what? The Mormon Temple. The Bountiful Temple, yeah, right? Yeah, like that's yeah the like Bountiful looming. Temple. Yep. Just, did yep. it loom large psychologically as much Always, as it did architecturally yeah. and geographically? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sits on the mountain. You can't miss it. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so growing up, I mean, was, I had a good childhood, I had lots of friends, um, but the gay issue was always looming over everything that I did. Although I had, I dated girls, because that's what you would do. Um, I still had some issues with some boys um, who, who, I mean, they were right, I was gay. Um, but for them, they found it very fun to um, tease me for being gay, although I was not out. And so in, in high school. In high school, you, yeah. You were teased. Yeah, and yeah. And it, and it was more than teasing. I think now, I mean, nowadays I would probably, it would probably end up being a hate crime on, on some of the things that I experienced with these boys. You were bullied. I was, I was bullied, yes, that's true. Um, your high school years were kind of what? What was the four-year range of your high school years? Just so I can get a sense for... Like year-wise? Yeah, uh, yeah. Graduating class, 04. So 2000 to 2004, you were yeah, in high school. Okay. in high school, yeah. So... A lot of bullies, uh, a lot of Mormons. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you this. You're being raised Mormon, and then there's that moment where you're like, wait a minute, am, am I gay? Uh-oh. How does that fit with Mormonism? And what does that mean for my life? Kind of, do you remember what age that was and how you started trying to process that and what that was like? Um, yeah, I was actually, was, I was super young. I was in, well, not super young, but I was in junior high, I think the eighth grade, um, I told my parents kind of what was going on. And they found a therapist through um, the church. Uh, we went and saw him. And luckily for me, the therapist had a twin brother who was gay. And so we basically told my parents, um, you, you either support him and, and you guys live like a great loving life where you guys are involved with each other, or you agree to disagree. And those are the only options that you have. And we agree that we disagree. And I know that sounds weird, but I'm fine with that, I guess. I don't. So as a kid, yeah. you go to this therapist, and and the agreement that you and your parents emerge with is what? Well, ba I, I mean, we actually, we didn't sit down and have an agreement, my, my parents and I. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a moment where we both said, you know, we agree to disagree. Um, the therapist basically explained to my mom that no matter what kind of therapy or anything we do, I'm gay. That's, that's just the way it is. She got upset, left the therapy room, and that was the last kind of discussion we had until in high school um, when uh, some boys thought it would be funny to spray paint my car with profanities on it and my sexuality. And that was the next conversation we had about you know, being gay. And um, because of that, I ended up going to Salt Lake Community College and getting graduating from high school, from Salt Lake Community College, first was Cross High because the bullying was so bad. While I was out, I, out at Salt Lake Community College, I was lucky enough to meet gay people. And luckily, one of them had a really supportive mom, and she said, you know, Clint, you need to just tell them that they know, your, your parents know you're gay, you guys have talked about it, but you haven't actually sat down and said, okay, I'm gay. So I, I called my, my brother and sister and um, went and saw them and was telling them what, you know, like trying to explain what was happening. And um, it went well, it went okay. I had, a, I had a brother who was eavesdropping and took the liberty to call my parents and let my parents know what I was doing. So he kind of stole my coming out story. Um, and things were really rough there for a minute with me and my family. We weren't really talking, we weren't, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I look back now, it was super crazy, and, um, but it could have been a lot worse, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and 
things are fine now. Um, be, I think because of all of that, I had a really rough 20s and I was looking for love or acceptance in all the wrong places because um, I wasn't getting it at home. So I had to go somewhere to find it and um, probably wasn't doing things I should have, I probably was not doing things I should have been doing in my 20s. That were healthy. That were healthy on time. all kinds of levels. And, um, but we met in my 20s during that time. Let me, if it's okay, before we jump into that, let me jump back a little bit. Okay. So many, almost all of the Mormon boys that I've interviewed sort of had this five to 10 sort of span of years where it's like, okay, I know I'm gay, but I gotta be Mormon. And so I'm gonna push it down and I'm gonna be as righteous as I can and go serve a mission. And then Heavenly Father will take it away. And then by the time I get off my mission, I'll be cured and I'll be able to marry a woman and have a great life. You, you are rare. That was and never an did, option. You that, didn't that do That was never that. an option. So tell me why. Tell me why you jumped off that track when so many other kids couldn't get off that track. Um, I don't know. I, I think um, I think at a young age, at that therapy appointment with my parents, I realized that that there was not going to be an option for me to change the way that I am. Because the therapist basically said, there's nothing you can do. And being gay, you, you really can't be Mormon. And I think at that time, I probably decided that I would just be alone forever. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have a partner or anything. Um, but going on a mission and, and doing that was, it just, it was nothing that ever even a, approached my mind. I mean, it, not had even you something. even had the traditional Mormon beliefs or had you not even been able to form those? Like the, Heavenly Father and like your future and the celestial kingdom. No, because I mean, I guess from a young age, I just knew, I knew I was different, and I just knew that wasn't something that I could be a part of. I don't, I don't know. I can't even tell you a favorite scripture. Um, I, this so you is, didn't, you didn't overly internalize Mormonism. It no, like. I don't, and I don't actually even know that much about it because you know, I was a kid. I, I mean, I was baptized. I became a deacon and passed the sacrament, but that's kind of where it ended for me. Okay. Okay. Um, it was always, fortunate then. Well, I, I think so. I mean, uh -huh. it was always something that yeah. I, yeah. It, was, it was something that I could have never, I never could connect to it. I never had any kind of connection to the church. Because there it, was no, no There was role. no place for me. There was no, the, place, there was for no place for me, yeah. Um, yeah. I just am so happy for you that you didn't have to lose those years. Yeah, well, I lost them in other ways, but. So that, that's what you mean by kind of experimenting. And, yeah, mm-hmm. But it's hard because, you know, I talked to Bruce a little bit about this. It's not like there's a template. Being raised in Bountiful, you're not given role models and you're not given sort of like, hey, here's a vision yeah. for what your life can be like. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely right. Yeah, I mean, like Bruce was saying earlier, with um, we had Will and Grace, which was like kind of, you know, the savior. And, and Will, Will never really had a serious relationship. And Jack was in and out of all these relationships. And I just figured I would be... More like Will, and you know, probably have a roommate who's a female, but we wouldn't be lovers. We'd be best friends, you know. And that's kind of how I looked at a lot of things growing, you know, in my early years. Yeah, you didn't see that future for yourself. Yeah, I never saw. I never saw me with children or a wife. I just it never. It wasn't something that ever crossed my mind. I mean, although I had girlfriends because that's what I was supposed to do, and um, but I never. They were never like. I never thought after high school we'll get married. You know, I never ever thought anything yeah. passed. It was after high school I could get out of here and live my <laughs> life. <laughs> and for now, do anything I can, you know, not to get beat up and keep my head down and get out. So that's what I did. And I don't think it's insignificant that you had to leave high school early to be safe. Yeah. And you had to go to a community college yep. to find safety earlier than you should have had to go, frankly. Yeah, yep. my senior year, yeah. It was a good thing for me. Um, you know, like at the time, I, I was, I'm like, okay, this will change everything. I'll go to college, um, things will change. Maybe I'll end up like Will, you know, I don't know. Um, but unfortunately, because I didn't have like the support system I, I guess I needed at home, the people I chose to, hang around, to run around with in my 20s weren't, um, weren't people, mostly weren't people I should have been involved with. And I think if 
things were different, maybe I would have picked a better path for my 20s. But now looking back, I think it worked out. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I have complaints about a few things, but not much. There's not much that I, I think everything kind of went the way it was supposed to go. So some people, when they kind of reach that state in early adulthood in Utah, they're like, I'm getting out of Utah. Yeah. I'm going to go to San Francisco. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to go somewhere that's more friendly. Did you decide to stay here? Yeah, well, I moved to the Gateway Mall. And um, for me, that, and, I, and I was working retail at the time, so for me, that was like the safest place I could be. There was a gay bar across the street. You know, like everything was open on Sunday. It was, it was like this cool metropolitan life. I was like living in the city and it was good. I had no, I mean, everyone dreams of maybe going to New York or California or something, but for me, Salt Lake was, was enough. It, it got me far enough away from Bountiful that um, I felt comfortable and free. So two, let's just say there's some kids, gay, gay Mormon kids that decide the church isn't for them and they're facing their 20s. Do you have any words of wisdom for them as they're, you know, fr from, from your years in the 20s? What, what, what words of wisdom do you offer? Um, I would definitely say follow your gut and choose your friends wisely. And if you feel that it's time for you to not be involved in the Mormon church, or if you need to take a break to figure that out, you gotta do what's best for you. You can't live, you cannot be happy if you're continually trying to please other people or be a part of something that, that doesn't accept you or who, for, for who you are. Um, so I would say, yeah, follow your gut and choose your friends wisely. And as you're, let's just say for these kids who leave the church and are just trying to figure out their 20s without the church, what, what are the criteria? What types of friends do they want? Um, I don't think it just has to be for the twenties. Anybody who's yeah, life. anybody who's contemplating that, uh, be around people who accept and love you for who you yeah. are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and don't be around people who want to change you yet further. Don't be around people who want to drag you into something that you feel uncomfortable with. That's just, I mean, that's just a formula for sadness. I think it would be a good idea to um, look at your values and, what, and, and the things you want out of your life and then look at your friends who you're surrounding yourself with and pick people that have the same kind of values. You know, I have a lot of good friends um, who, who, were way, who were raised Mormon and are no longer Mormon, so we share some of the same values. And, um, and you, can find, you can find people who, all over the world, any kind of race or religion who will accept you for who you are, but they got to um, love you for who you are and encourage you to be the person you are. And I think having a checklist, the p picking out the kind of people you want to be around really helps you come into yourself and live a happier life. I wasn't very good at that in my early 20s. <laughs> I was so, looking for feel, things that made me feel good, not things that were good for me. Beautiful. So, so as you as you think back to your twenties, uh, did you imagine yourself being being married someday? Was that something you were no, shooting for? No, for? Uh, I mean, I had, uh, I mean, I had a couple of serious relationships. Not, I mean, I can't, looking back at them now, I don't even call them serious because the the groundwork, the relationship was laid on was rocky. So, um, I I thought either I would be single or maybe have like a boyfriend type that I lived with, but I never. No, I never, I mean, even when people bring up, you know, fight for marriage equality, and at that point, I wasn't really involved or cared. I think maybe because being raised Mormon and having the idea that I would never be accepted or have a family, I was fine with not having rights because I just felt that was, that was a trade-off of not being in Bountiful and not having a wife and having kids. I don't know, I know that sounds really demented and not normal, but... I guess when you're in that situation, you, you take trade-offs that you say, okay, this is fine. Um, it wasn't until like later years when I realized, no, I deserve the same rights as my straight neighbors. Like or I, your brothers and sisters. Or my siblings, yeah, or my, or my parents. You know, I deserve, I deserve the same rights that they have, and, and why not? Um, but, you know, there's a par part of your life where you, if you've been raised Mormon, where you just don't think you deserve anything, and this is just what you get, and you just... You know, you, you, you deal with the cards you're dealt. 
Did you have dark moments? Oh in yeah. Those years? Oh yeah. 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 Yep. What What made What made them feel particularly dark? Um, I was I was totally alone. Um, you know, although I I did have some relationships, they weren't they weren't healthy at all. There wasn't a single aspect of any of the relationships that I had that were healthy. Um, and that's it's actually like a, a really scary place to be when when you feel like you have nothing and there's nothing there, you become this different kind of person where nothing really matters, if that makes sense. And you just live this life that's not meaningful. And um, that's what I was doing for, for a few years. It's survival. Instead of living, it's just surviving. Yeah. Did you end up picking a, a, you know, a certain major to study and a certain career to pursue? No, no, I was, I was avoiding all of that because of the feelings of I don't deserve any of that being a gay man, if that makes sense. That you didn't just, feel like you deserved it. No, it just wasn't, it was, no, it just wasn't anything that I, it's really weird because, you know, at a time in my life where, I mean, I was already going to college classes, I should have just kept going, but I don't know what happened. It, just none of it felt like it was for me. It just, you know, it's, I look back at it now and I'm like, it's, it was really probably scary. And you, I'm just thinking that if you're raised as if you don't count, yeah. there's no future for you, there's no hope. Then when you reach adulthood, what do you have as a, as a role, as role models, as a vision, as a structure? You have nothing. You have nothing. Like, so like, to go back to like my high school days when I was having when I was being bullied by those boys and um, the school had to get involved because it was happening at school, but their only re response was, "This is an issue you need to deal with at home." So it was like, at home they don't want to deal with the issue. I go to school and school doesn't want to deal with the issue, and it was like this place of just isolation where you know. You don't really, I mean, I had supportive friends who were, who were, when I came out, gave me hugs and loved me and were there for me um, in the, like the straight community. But um, growing up feeling that this is an issue that has to happen somewhere else, not where you currently are, if that makes sense. Like the issue was happening at school. It wasn't happening anywhere else, it was happening at school. But the school said, no, you have to deal with this issue at home. Well, how do I do that when it's happening when I come to school? So it was this weird place where, where you're, you're basically, you don't feel safe anywhere. And you're, you're, just, you're just kind of living day by day because that's just, I don't know. It's, it, was a, it was a weird, weird time of my life. And you lose your faith community, and so you don't have the ward or the friends. Yeah, you, leave, you lose the youth, everything. The youth programs, nope. you have kind of nothing. Nope. And it's almost like, I don't know that it's intentionally designed that way, but it, it's, it's worse than that. You're just... There's no design for you. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me just butt in and say, <clears throat> I, I have felt for a long time that the straight community loved gay people being in the closet. Yeah. Just, you know, live in silence, live out of our sight, out of our mind. We don't, just don't be who, just stay in the dark shadows. And that's kind of a, when you're struggling coming out, regardless of where, how your story is, I think that's part of it you are kind of in your own closet and and it's darkness it's really sad and lonely yeah, yeah. and potentially deadly yeah. potentially deadly potentially deadly so clint what turned your life around what were the what were the formative moments that helped you see that you actually deserved a joyful life and that you could have a future and that you deserved a future there is a few throughout throughout my 20s um I met Bruce when I was 21, and immediately <clears throat> when we met, I knew there was something special there. I don't know what it was, but there was some kind of connection. Um, and that was just before I dived into probably the darkest part of my life. <laughs> um, and what, what, let me ask: Is was there anything that kept you guys from dating then, or get or forming a relationship then? We we started forming like a friendship, a yeah, really yeah, really yeah. good really good friendship. Um, you know, Bruce was, Bruce was traveling, Bruce had things going on in his own life. Um, and I was like beginning my self-destructive pattern, you know, like behavior. So I wasn't even present to even be in a, it was, 
we had a phone call email relationship for years. We didn't even really, we'd see each other every once in a while, but not, not nearly often enough. But so through those years, Bruce and I would email, he'd be traveling and. And Bruce, let me ask, what were your, what were your thoughts about Clint in those early years? I, I, I thought he was a wonderful young man. Um, I thought he was troubled. I thought he lacked self-confidence. I mean, in a very major way. Uh, I thought he had a lot of uh, insecurities that were not founded. Um, I, I, I just thought he, there's so many times I just wanted to like virtually put my arms around him and say, you can do this, you can do this, you know, but we, we rarely saw each other. Yeah. Did you have any inkling that there was potential Bruce for a long-term relationship with Clint back then? then? No. Yeah. It didn't even cross your mind. No. no. And Clint, did you have no. any? <laughs> no, no, because I never really, I mean, I never really thought I'd be in a serious long-term relationship. Yeah. It, it just was something that the ones that had happened that became serious just happened. It wasn't like this, this thing that we talked about, we're going to do this life. They just kind of like fell into place and then it fizzled out as quickly as it, as it started. Um, but yeah, so through those years, Bruce and I had always um, communicated and, Bruce is not afraid to say how he feels. <laughs> so I got several emails and phone calls that were not, that I, at the time, thought they were really rude. But they were probably some of the best emails and phone calls that I had because... What were the types of things being communicated? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, stand up for yourself. Yeah. Uh, do something <clears throat> about it. Do, don't you, just sit there if, and... If you, if you don't like this happening... Change it. Change yeah. it or stop it. Uh, but you know, we were, he's only giving one side of the story and that we were both in pretty unhealthy, destructive, unhealthy, unhealthy relationships. relationships. And, and when, when either one of us, when either one of us got really down, either in an email or a phone call, we would talk. Yeah, we'd work it out with each other, kind of. And he told me, he told me often that the person I was, trying to have a relationship with was wrong and well, he dark. Was, he was just like the person I was involved with. Yeah. They, they were very, very similar. <laughs> They're very, very similar. It's interesting. But dark because, and controlling. Yeah, but because of all of that, because um, of the dialogue and the conversations we kept um, having, one day I thought, you got to stop. What, like, is this going to be your life? You know, nothing. And um, so I got into some intense therapy. And um, around what age was that? 27. 27? 27, 28. Was that earlier? Maybe 20, 27. How'd you find a good therapist? So this is crazy. So all along, I had been, I knew I needed help with what I was doing and what was going on with my life. I just didn't know where, where to find it or what to do. So, and, um, so I just started, there was like this search online where you would check these boxes and it would provide therapists that were, um, that dealt with your issues. Um, and the one therapist I got, she actually didn't really deal with the kind of issues I had, but she showed up and she had like this mom face. And I thought that's kind of what I needed was like a mom moment. And so that's how I found her. I mean, I saw her sometimes twice a week for like five years. And what? Yeah, uh -huh, for a you long time. Did yeah, five years of therapy. Yeah, yep. That oh, was John, amazing. I probably did twenty years of therapy. So you guys are and awesome. I went, and, and I went through several therapists. therapists until one would give up on me, and I'd choose another one. Yeah. So, Good yeah. for both And she of got you. to that point too. She's like, if you come in here next week saying the same thing, you're not coming in here anymore. And I'm like. Wow. She was tough on you. Yeah. Bruce is now saying that to me. She's saying that to me. So do it. Like, change your life. Do it. So What I, were the big changes you had to make, Clint? Um, the circle of friends I was hanging out with. You needed to change your friends. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I needed to um, reconnect with friends from my past who gave me a sense of who I was and how I became the person I am. And um, the one major thing, because I was, I was so paranoid of going in public, the therapist, the first thing she made me do was go to lunch alone in a busy restaurant. Mm. 
Mm. And that, I mean, out of all the hard things I had to do, that was probably the most difficult thing to do. And then it became... Why was that so hard? I don't know. Because I... I, 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 I There's this idea of distracting and running away from yourself. Yeah. Were you doing that? Yeah, I and I was just running away from everyone. I didn't want anyone to see me. I mean, I was not happy of who I was or the things I was doing. And so being in public gave the option of people seeing the way I was and how I was behaving. And I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. So, um, she, I remember him actually talking to me about that. Well, I was supposed to meet you at pride that one year and I never showed up. Yeah. I mean, I pulled up, I parked my car and I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. So she said, you need to start by going, you know, take a newspaper or a book, go to a restaurant and have lunch alone. So you just had anxiety of, of being in public. Like, I, I mean, it, it developed to that. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like that, but over the years it developed to that. And so then I stopped seeing my therapist and my therapy kind of became my lunch date every Monday or Tuesday by myself, you know, at, at a restaurant. And you just kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Until the pandemic. I still did it. Huh? Yeah. I go to lunch alone, sit at a restaurant. You kept that going. Yeah. Because I, I needed, I needed to know that I, I could still, I don't know, that gave me some kind of power, gave me some kind of confidence wow. sitting at the bar alone where all these people are with their friends. I don't know. It, I don't know how, I don't know why, it just, it just did. And I did it until February. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, you start going out more, yep. you change your friends. Yep. What other changes did you start making? Um, I started going back to school for a little bit. Um, and what were you interested in? I was just going for my generals, because okay. I, hadn't, I hadn't done anything with school. I was trying to figure out where, you know, what to do, where to go. Um, basically, I was starting from like, Nothing, ground zero, um, rebuilding my life. And um, then I ended up, I, I had to move back home. So I guess that's a part I missed out. Through these bad relationships, I ended up having to move back home to Bountiful, and, um, which was really, really tough because it's kind of like brought me back to all of the past trauma. And, the bullying. And yeah, and at the time I was a smoker. And so my mom would make a big deal about me smoking not in the neighborhood, so neighbors wouldn't see me. And it was just, it was really, really hard. It was like, I was at home with my family where I should be safe, but I couldn't be me. Um, but also super great that they would let you stay, yeah, right? Yeah, you'd yeah, have a home. yeah, super great, yeah. yeah. I think in a way my mom would love it if I just stayed there forever. Because <laughs> <laughs> you love your mom. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and yeah, uh, I love both of them dearly, yeah. Um, they've been great parents. But so through all of that, I started going back to school. I I started working again and then um we i actually was doing stuff in public and we would start we started going on dates again like actual dates and not like therapy sessions or him complaining about his life and me complaining about my life and you know um what type of job were you having at that point um well so this is crazy um because of everything i was doing the first job i when i started going back to work is i was driving a cab in midville <laughs> And I think that was probably one of the biggest opening This things. is pre-Uber, pre- This is just before Lyft. Uber. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like- Like a yellow cab kind of thing or? It was um, a silver, yeah, basically yellow cab, but it was a silver van, minivan. Um, <laughs> my mom's friend worked for this cab company and she did, she worked there at night. And I said, can I just drive like one or two days a week? Cause I wasn't even, I mean, I would go out to the store, but I go to like Walmart at night or, you know, I wasn't doing anything to see anybody and I thought, this, is, this would be a way that I would be stuck in a place with a stranger and would have to, like, communicate and kind of get back into life. It was like my reintroduction to society. And um, I didn't do that for very long until I said, I am not doing this ever again. But he, has some, <laughs> he has some amazing stories from that time. Yeah. But and, um, and it was nice because it, it gave me an appreciation for, you know, all kinds of different people because the people I, I was driving around all forms of life. So it was actually a good way to start my found, the foundation of me respecting other people, appreciating people being different, me realizing that I'm different and that's just fine. And um, things just started getting better from there. I get, I mean, I can't really say like this day or this moment, yeah. everything changed, but things got easier. I got happier, I got healthier and um, we ended up dating, and then we started traveling. And when did you guys start dating? What, around what year? Twenty thirteen ish, twenty twelve. Okay, so let's pause. And Bruce, 
let's talk about like I'm sure in your mind you know you didn't always envision you and Clint ending up together so let's talk about once Clint started coming into your life face to face what what was going through your mind and what how were you seeing Clint and I remember when we first one of the first times I just invited him to just just come over and we'll 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 watch a movie we'll just just come over to the house and we'll just watch a movie and now, was this friendship or like you kind of thought he was cute or something? Oh, like? I, I thought he was cute. I thought... I, I what would like, you like about Clint? What, it, what he, attracted he, you to Clint for the very beginning? He's he's funny. <laughs> he's funny. He's a, he's so great to talk to. He's just... And he just kind of... And I also like the fact that he just, you know, he didn't care about my success or anything. I just had to be... You know, he cared about the Bruce he saw or was getting to know, and he didn't, the, the other stuff was unimportant, and that really, that really mattered to me. Well, when I first met him, I met him at a bar, and I had never heard of Bruce Bastion. Right. I thought he was this guy from Europe. Um, I had no, I, no idea. First, like, several months, I had no, like, I didn't even... The Bruce I met was just this this interesting, brilliant, nerdy, funny <laughs> guy, and I I didn't you know like of course later on I found obviously I know about everything now, but at the beginning it I think that's probably what made our relationship work was because I had no idea anything about Bruce you know like I he asked for my number I gave him my number and. We hung out, and I, I said, what do you do? And he said, I retired. I used to work in the computer industry, and I thought maybe he, like, invented a golf game or, like, solitaire. You know, like, <laughs> st- I had no idea. It, it, that was where the conversation ended. And what, what was it that was interesting to you about maybe a guy that's a little bit older, like an older guy? What, what did you like about that? I've always been attracted to older men. It's, what do you it, like about just that? Um, the confidence. Um, they... You know, like older men, when I was in my 20s dating 30 or 40 years old, they just seem more, um, more themselves, more um, comfortable. Authentic. Authentic, yeah. yeah. They just, they knew what they were doing. They were comfortable in their own skin. And that gave me like a little bit of safety because, you know, I'm with someone who is, who is okay with who they are you know like they've been through all the shit I was going through and um it was nice makes sense it it it, it felt safe the older men have always felt safe to me which I'm sure that people think that's, that's weird. really not true all the time but okay <laughs> well there's some yeah but you have bad days is that what you're saying Bruce <laughs> you have bad days I I think I'm much more authentic today than I was mm-hmm. 10 years ago or even five years ago yeah I you think know, we're all just, on a journey, right? Yeah, it's a journey. And but it being that that first time he came over to watch a movie, we didn't make it through the whole movie. He left because he didn't feel comfortable. Oh. He just it was said, the crown, wasn't it? What was wrong? What was wrong, Clint? I don't know. I left my dog at home, which kind of became my support blanket um at the moment. I don't know. I just I hadn't been with it spending time with people who were living an authentic, honest, normal life, he's just, you know? He's, he still was having issues, I think. He still was having issues just relaxing and being himself. Yeah, being present. And, and that was still an issue he was fighting with. I would also guess there is, I noticed this in myself and others psychologically, that like when you get close to something really good, you wonder if you deserve it, and yeah. if, and if, or if it's too good to be true. Yep. Are either of those possible? Yeah, totally possible. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of times we would go. I mean, he took me to the White House, and I'm like, no, I, I should not be going to the White House. You know what I mean? Like, no, I'm not doing this. Like, a lot of things that I thought, no, I don't deserve this, or this is not in my life. This isn't something for me. Um, but. I think it's good because it's kept me in a pers- it's kept things in perspective, and I've been able to um, appreciate the things I need to appreciate. But at first, means. you were afraid, and yeah. so oh, yeah. over Terrified. time, what happened? 
We just started, it really started watching The Crown here. It's kind of what... The Crown. The Crown. It's, kind uh, of, it's a great show. Yeah. Was it The Crown? Super great no. show. The, it was before that. It, what was the one before The Crown? Wasn't it The Crown? Anyways, I don't know what show it was. Some British show we were watching. Um, and just spending more and more time with him alone. And then we would go out with, with his friends and stuff. And it kind of just, things just started feeling okay and normal again with that. I mean... But it was a very slow progress. Yeah. We became, I always tell people, we, you know, we, we became, we became friends. friends first. Yeah. And through those really dark years, we became the one person we trusted. We could, we could tell anything we wanted to tell. We could, and we felt safe in our communication. And we built this, this very, this foundation of communication, communication and trust. Yeah. Yep. And that's, what it all, not knowing you could end up together. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yep. I mean, it's funny because, I mean, obviously Bruce is older than I am. And so he has a lot more baggage and, and, and things, but I wouldn't say I know all of it. I think I know most of it, but I don't really care about it at this point, if that makes sense. You know, like that was the past. This is the present. And, um, you've each got your past, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Everyone does, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and, it's a good thing that we were so low that we were able to like open up that communication, which has been like the foundation of our relationship is, you know, we talk about everything, even if it's uncomfortable, and you don't want to, that's what we do. So how long was the time between sort of you're really starting the date and you guys getting really serious where you start talking about like, maybe I could live the rest of my life with this person. How long was that time? When did I move in? It was from the time you moved home and then you went to the apartment in Sugar House. And before, I mean, when I first suggested that you move in here, oh, hell no. <laughs> that, was, that was not even... Around that, when was that? I don't, I don't know. Was it 13, 14? So six, six years ago, six, six years or seven ago? years ago? Yeah. You want him to come move in, and what are you thinking, Clint? You're like... Well, I mean, it's... It was a little overwhelming, the idea of moving in um, for several reasons. Um, was it commitment? Was it just like an, an uncertainty? Well, the uh, last, the, the other time you moved in with a guy, it didn't end up very well. No. <laughs> it was a lot of things. I felt like um, if moving in what was like t took away some of my like individuality, I guess in a way, like I was. Um, but then I realized that I'm building a relationship. And although I still have, still have my individuality, we have like a, a relationship, I don't, um, personality, I don't know what you would call it, that had I not moved in, it would have never grown to anything more. And so like the next step was, I mean, were, were we just gonna be on the fence for the rest of our lives? And, were we, just gonna, we, were we just going to be friends and that's where it was going to end or were, were we going to take it or at least attempt, attempt to something take it different. to yeah. the next step? Now, Bruce, you had been jaded and kind of disillusioned. So what made you think you could hope, hope for something when you, when you had had so many bad experiences? So, um, I don't know. I, I guess it's, maybe I'm kind of a, a, a hopeful romantic or a dreamer, uh, but but you're right that the other relationships I had been in were all pretty good until I attempted to actually have a, a mutual relationship where we actually lived together, and that's where things always fell apart. Okay. So you're right. What made me think I could make things different with Clint? I think it was just because I I just felt so comfortable and so I uh, I just trusted I I felt like I actually got to know him. I wasn't I wasn't asking a stranger to move in. I was asking by this guy who was rapidly becoming my best and most trusted friend. Yeah. So, yeah, so I moved in and, um, 
I guess that's, we ended up getting married a few years later. Okay, so what year were you married? 20, 2018. 2018. Okay, so Clint, you would have been with Bruce during the, the lead up to marriage equality. So would you have been helping Bruce and sort of accompanying Bruce in his activities with the well, HRC? Well, yeah, I, I, I would always go with Bruce to all the HRC events and stuff. So um, what was that like to kind of become an activist yourself? Or, or do you, did you think of yourself that way? I, you know, that's funny because we were talking about this the other day. I'm like, do gay people, autom- are we just automatically activists? <laughs> like, what, what, how did this all happen? And um, I think um, the experiences I had in school and the experiences I had in my 20s, um, they were not okay. And I don't think they would have happened in a world where LGBTQ people were, were more accepted. And if, if one person's life can be changed by getting involved, then I think I've done something great. If one person can go through school without being bullied, I think I've done something great. And um, Bruce always, Bruce has always said, you know, you have a story, and you've you've seen a lot of this stuff happening in your own life. Like we could, we can change that. We can, or we can at least work to change try it. To change try it. to change it. And um, so I guess I I was my youth was turning me into an activist, and um, which is kind of nice. I guess. I mean, <laughs> what what is an activist? An activist is someone who who sees something wrong and wants to change it uh whether it's for himself herself or just for humans in general i mean we celebrated the life of john lewis and he was a he was an activist and he basically stood on if if you see something wrong do something yeah stand up say say something something. do something and i think so it's hard to be it's hard to live a life as a gay person and not do something. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of them who don't do much. I agree, get that, but there are a lot of them who do, even little things, you know. So as someone who kind of watched a bit from a distance, you know, I, I, I attended Equality Utah galas or allies dinners for years. I attended HRC events, and I would all see you guys together. And I think that for those who are kind of involved in those communities, they have, you know, it's always Bruce Passion. Well, Bruce Passion is helping, and there's his name, and there's all the efforts. But the truth is, a lot of that, a lot of those efforts have been both of you. Is that right? In the last, in the last five, six years, yeah. yes. Yeah, and those are yeah. some important years, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We actually, um, <clears throat> the whole activism theme was really like weird for me at first because it's it's a different world, and but we actually um, we sit down and we talk about the things we want to be involved in and the, and the efforts we want to help support. Um, I am on, I sit on the board of his Bruce's foundation. So I'm involved. It's the Bruce Bastion Foundation. The BW Bastion Foundation. Okay. Yeah. You know. So I'm heavily involved in that, those efforts that, um, see, it's, it's kind of like he was, so to digress a little bit, I, I never ended up going to college, which is something that I, um, still think about maybe one day I'll do, which is nice to hear that you did that later on in life and became um, a doctor. So I, so there's still hope for me, but like he said afterward, perfect and not working, seeing the changes in, you know, activism life is far more rewarding than any money or any degree or accolade you could get. And I'm starting to witness that. And I think, you know, like it is rewarding and it's fulfilling and, I'm happy to do it, and I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm actually involved, and I'm able to do it. So you're saying if you do go go back to school, or if you pursue some type of education or training, it might be along the lines of nonprofits or phil- yeah, yeah. philanthropic stuff. Yeah, yeah. because you've got the bug. Yeah, I've got the bug. Yeah, and I I see. I, I mean, I've seen that. I've seen change. I've seen it work. I've seen the the change for, um, for marriage equality. I've I've witnessed all of that in my lifetime, and it it. A lot of change, in a, I feel like, in a short period of time, and that's very encouraging. I mean, I know the last couple of years have been kind of rough for different reasons, but um, I'm hopeful, and I, and I think that it's... You, it, you start to realize that change doesn't happen on its own. Uh, this arc of equality has to be pushed, and 
that's when you feel like you're actually part of it. It it is amazing it's, to yeah, it's, it's, it's a rewarding. wonderful feeling. Yeah. So when uh, same sex marriage was legalized in 2015. Uh, I imagine it was a great time for you as well, Clint. Uh -huh. Something you were really happy to see. I was happy to see it, but I was also kind of scared. Why? Because it's like, okay, this is real. You know, like now I can get, now I, I'm like actually a human being in society. I can get married. I can actually make a life. So, I mean, it, not scared in a bad way, but you know, it was, it was a change. Cause I never, even, even though we were living together, I mean, we couldn't get married. So I never even really planned on getting married. And then that happened and it was like, oh. Well, now you got to rethink of what you thought your life was going to be because now you have the option you could you could get married, which it was it was exciting and it was it was kind of scary. Because, I don't know why. I don't know. I I think maybe it's because I knew at that point our relationship would probably go on to the next level and we'd get married. And I and I realized how big of a life change that is and and how big that is in someone's life a marriage a union like that. And so um, it was a little. But we it's scary. But we really didn't. We didn't talk about us getting married. We didn't. No. We, it was still just. Yeah, we were happy for everybody who was getting married and everything. But yeah, we, we weren't. We weren't jumping off that cliff yet. No. So what led to that uh, decision? Uh, oh, I think a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> we had a year of gay weddings. Yeah. where we were traveling all over the place, like watching all these couples get married. And um, it was wonderful. I would, I would, some of the most emotional times I've seen has been at these, uh, seeing our friends who've been together for years get married. We, had, we have friends who have been together for 44 years and they could finally get married. It was like this, I mean, yeah. amazing. And we were on a date night kind of talking about it. And I think we both realize it's yeah. now or never you know like what yeah. what are we working for what are we what is what is all this what is all this what's happening it's for everybody else yeah is what, it is. what is this gonna what are, <laughs> what are we doing with this like should we get married and we just kind of looked at each other and said but yes yeah. <laughs> and so, that was what year um it was <coughs> december 17 december 17 yeah so two years after marriage equality yeah yeah two and a half three years, years ago yeah. Right. Yeah. Three years it's, ago. It's in November. Yeah. Uh, December. Okay. Okay. So, oh, what? Hmm? What was that? It was oh, December. 20... December seventeenth. Yeah. Okay. So, Bruce, let's go back in time a tiny bit. When we did your interview ten years ago, um, you your relationship with your ex wife was what it was, and your relationship with your kids was what it was. Let's go back in time and talk about that evolution and bring it up to the point of your of your wedding because I think it's nice to weave in family and it's not always going to be easy or, or simple. Sometimes it's messy. But let's have each of you talk about how your family relationships dovetail into that special moment when you're married and what's, and what's progressed for your families from those early years until now. Um. My, I have four sons. They're each wonderful, amazing fathers and husbands. And they're all married. Yes, they're all active LDS men. All four? Yeah. Wow. And uh, I, I think I said in a previous interview that I wanted to always keep that door open. I wanted them to always know that I love them. You know, there were certain things about me I was not going to change, nor could I. Uh, but I wanted to to keep that path open. They're all older. They all have their own kids. This, this thing about fatherhood, the reality of fatherhood has kind of sunk into them all. Uh, my relationship with them has been more of an individual path than anything else. They're all their own person. And I love that and I respect that. Uh, they all have wives who are, have become very supportive and loving of me and now us. And it just, 
It was just kind of a natural evolution. They lost their mother, which was a really hard time for them. But you know, when one of your parents passes on, I think it's kind of normal that you kind of start looking at the one surviving parent in a slightly different way. And I, I think that might have been part of it. I don't know. But my relationship with them got stronger. The, but the fact that they, they supported us in our wedding, that we all, we have a really good, open, honest relationship with them individually and their families, as well as collectively, is that's really that's really important to me and so gratifying. So uh, I have to tell you one special story, and that's about one of my daughters-in-law. When she found out, uh, when when we when she found out that uh, we were getting married, she called and said, uh, um, "She's coming over. I'm coming over. I want to meet Clint." Okay, so. Kind of got the. So your daughter-in-law says, "I want to meet Clint." Uh -huh. All yeah. right, on my way over, <clears throat> basically. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was uh, basically a family interview. Uh, <laughs> she was checking Clint out. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, this is before yeah. the wedding. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but she's great, and she's been so supportive. And so what was that interview like, Clint? It, and I mean, you do you know it's, it was. <laughs> um, Obviously, I was nervous, and I didn't so know what, I. I didn't know what to think or what or anything. Um, mainly because <clears throat> they had the the kids and the daughter in laws really had never known anything about Bruce's private, personal dating romantic life. They just that was not something that came up in conversations. Um, I had met his older son at the New Yorker once. I mean, we've crossed paths a few times, um, but it was always, you know, his, his kids and that life and then our life. Just, it's just the way it was set up to be. And so, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know much about him. I didn't know what to expect. Um, it, was, it, was, it ended up being wonderful and she was great. And um, part of it was my fault because I kind of tried to compartmentalize my children life my life and my private romantic life and uh that of course is all blown up and merged into one, one now, now huh. which is a good thing uh it's part of what i needed to learn about living an honest open authentic life don't be ashamed of any part of you if you have to be ashamed of any part of your life there's something wrong there somewhere and not that i was ashamed but i was nervous about one segment learning too much about the other segment, the other segment. Mm -hmm. why there was never a reason for that so once we not got rid of that down yeah barrier how was that to break that barrier down that wall of separation it was, nice. it was wonderful it was nice, yeah and so much easier than i thought it would yep. be yeah 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 so when you told, and we'll come to you in a second, Clint, when we told your sons and your daughters-in-law, and maybe grandkids by this point, that you're getting married, well, how was that for you to have to, to deliver that news? Uh, I, I called them each individually and had very honest conversations. And uh, it was... For the most part, it was very accepting, very rewarding, very good. Uh, so it went better than I than I thought. But I was I was not going to even contemplate getting married unless I I wasn't hoping so much for their blessing as just for their okay, Dad, did you know do what you do? But I got for the most part, I got their support and their blessing and. It's been getting better for the last two yeah. and a half years. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. So, Clint, you have this family in Bountiful, and yes. uh, I, I, I don't know what they were imagining for you, but I imagine that you saying, "Hey, I'm getting married," might have come as a shock to them. Um, it did, and it didn't. Um, 
I had my I had two siblings who thought we ran down to the courthouse when Utah <laughs> passed the um, marriage law, and they thought we were down there and Ralph Becker married us. They kind of already they all they and I, even my parents even eventually said we all just kind of figured you guys had already been married. Um, but they they were all supportive. My siblings came. Um, it wasn't a place for my parents to come. They just did not feel comfortable doing that. And that, at first, was, I mean, I knew that's what they were going to say. Um, at first, it was kind of like, I can't believe that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's probably the best decision that, you know, they did not come. It would have changed the feeling of the day. But you are that, close to them. It's I'm not still like you're close, not close to them. To them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still, I mean, I go up and I see my parents when we're in town once a week. And at least, that's a lot. Yeah. Once a week's a yeah. lot. Well, she still likes to have her Sunday <laughs> family dinner. So I go up and participate in that. Nice. Um, and I mean, we talk a lot. It's You're very close to your family for the most part. You, you and your mother and you and your sister talk a lot. A lot, yeah. Yeah. It's nice that those ties have been able to, to stay there. Yep. Even, even if... Maybe the church can't always allow a full celebration of yeah. what you guys have Well, and they're nice. They ask about Bruce, and they ask about us. So it's not like <clears throat> it didn't happen. You know, it's not like they're living this imaginary world where that we didn't get married. I'm not married. I'm not gay. I mean, they're getting better in every... I mean, as time goes on, you know, we, we talk about it more and more, which is nice. Yeah. So any highlights from your from your wedding? Where where'd you get married? And any highlights you want to share about that? We got married in Orem in, in the house at the in house. The, at the house. It was a June wedding, so everything was in done Wayne, outside. Wayne Manor, I like to call it. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite a wedding. Um, I think we had more flowers than <clears throat> most any other wedding I've ever been to. Was, more flowers yeah. than people, maybe? Yeah, well definitely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was nice. Um, it, was, it was we who officiated. Um, the Chad Griffin. He used to be the president of the Human Rights Campaign. Yeah. Yeah. So he officiated. It was, it was, it was really a special day. Um, I was rooting for something smaller and quieter, but you know. No, you weren't. <laughs> no. But, but, yes. No. <laughs> I had a different <laughs> wedding in mind, but Bruce wanted to have it here, so we did. I mean, it was it. It was a magical day. We had friends from all over the world. They came and stayed with us for like the week leading up to the wedding. It 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 really was. It was magical. Everybody was happy. So I've I've had people since I built that house. Uh, I've had people request to have a wedding yeah. there. I always said no. So yeah, maybe I pushed it. I'm sure I did push it. But I I said I want there to be one great wedding at this pl property and I want it to be mine so so we did you got it yeah it was it was it was quite a day um yeah yeah, I mean, yeah. I, well, go ahead oh no you go ahead what was it like to be able to enjoy the thing that you had been fighting for for others for so long emotional it was very emotional uh I got teary I mean, yeah. Why? Because it never really hit me until that day that so much of my energy and my money has been spent on trying to get to that spot. And then it was finally happening, and it was like, wow. It was just, yeah. I'm glad we didn't run down to the courthouse yeah, me in, too. When, we, when we, the first chance we had. We did this very purpose, purposely and thoughtfully, and really every minute of that day we we thought out and mm -hmm. planned, and and then and, and then it all the reality of it all hit, and it was really something. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty amazing to see like my siblings, my family there, and Bruce's children there, and my sisters. Yeah, and Bruce's and siblings, grand grandkids. <clears throat> No, grandkids. no, no grandkids, okay, yeah. uh, nieces and nephews. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a I had a huge amount of family support there, mm -hmm. and uh, people I'd known professionally and 
friends in the community. We, it was it was a full bandwidth of our support. lives, yeah. yeah, and sections of our lives that people came to support us. It was it was it was actually like okay, think if like uh, confirmation or validation, validation, yeah, like. It, it, it really felt good. And have everybody there together and have them supporting us was something I, I never thought would happen. I mean, I just didn't. And it did. And it was a beautiful day. And, and I'm glad we did it big now because it was, yeah. it was something that we and everyone who got to be there will always remember. Yeah. It was, yeah. What has, Bruce, what has being married meant to you? for the past three years? It is, <clears throat> um, it has really taken down all the barriers. And I think, I, I really am on this kick now of authenticity. Uh, and you have to erase the barriers. You have to, you have to get rid of all the things that cloud your life in any way. And I just think that process is, it takes guts maybe, but it's actually easier to do than some might expect. You just have to say, no, that, that thing or that person or that process isn't, doesn't really reflect who I really am. So either change it or get rid of it. And I think that's why I can honestly say I'm happier than I've ever been is because I was able to get rid of or change some of those things that weren't allowing me to just be, you. be who I am. You do seem more calm, calm or yeah. strong or steady or certain yep. just in your demeanor than 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Who knows you can grow that much in 10 years? Well, it's his fault. Uh, <laughs> has, has that helped? Has, has oh, Clint Clint, been, oh, my God. Yes. Has uh, helped in your personal growth? Oh, yes. Yeah. He, he's, he, first of all, he knows me. And I can't pretend to do something or be something that isn't really me because he calls me out. <laughs> And, uh, and likewise, I mean, it go, it's, it's both ways. Both of us are much more calm. And I don't and know I, if it's confidence. I don't know I'm what we both got from being married, but we both have a sense of, like, like our aura is just much better. We're better. We feel like we're better people. We feel healthier. We, we feel like we are who we are. And there's, like, no hiding it. And in some ways, so I can go out and I, and I get to the point, so... You may not love me or appreciate me, <clears throat> but I got one person who does. And regardless of what this other person or mm -hmm. I, I can get to the point where this is what matters the most. And as long as <clears throat> I do things that I know he will approve of or appreciate, I'm okay. Isn't that wonderful? It yeah. is wonderful, yeah. Yes, it is absolutely wonderful. And what would you add, Clint, to that? I, I was, I was going to just say that basically the same thing is that I think um, it's given us a sense of, like you said, we're, we're valid. We're, we've been, it gives us this, this ownership of our relationship, of our life, and it's a statement that we love each other and we're committed to each other. And, I mean, it wasn't something that we took lightly. I mean, it's been in the works for years, and... Um, I would say it, it's comforting. I guess being married is, it's comfortable. I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's, I feel fine. I, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice feeling to have that People's, I, that I never thought, I never even thought there was that feeling of comfort and safety and love, you know, like it's nice. Say, and it's nice to have an honest relationship where, yeah. where we actually talk and communicate and we're, we're uplifting each other. We're not, we're not. We're not unhealthy for each other. We, it's good. People's, people have asked, so what's changed since you got married? And really nothing, but really everything. Everything, yep. 
So what what we do in our daily life hasn't changed, changed. really at all. But how we do it and how we feel about the things we do has changed a lot. Yeah. It, it kind of makes, um, well, I would think for you, fighting for marriage equality kind of paid off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which way. is nice, you know, it's, it's good. Yeah. Beautiful. So let's take a couple... I don't want to say tangents, but side routes. Okay. There is this idea that, um, okay, we got marriage equality now. Life's good for LGBT people. We're all good. We can all go back to our straight lives or whatever other lives we have because now we've checked that box. You guys got what you wanted. And people don't need to be worried about the LGBT rights or, you know, the environment in, in this country. Tell me how wrong I am. Is there still work to do? And if so, what's the work that needs to be done yeah. since I'm sure the activism hasn't died just because you're married? No. <laughs> uh, I would think, I would say, in a lot of ways, life for gays and lesbians has improved. In a lot of ways, the lives of transgender people has maybe gotten worse because there aren't, only, there aren't any laws on the books really protecting trans people in most places. So the legislators and the, the excuse me, but the anti-rights or the ultra-right conservative people, they find an opening for the trans people and that's who they're going after. Mm -hmm. And it's mean. I mean, there are the, the, the number of trans women who are killed every year and that's going up and up yep. and up it's disgusting and it's horrific, and uh, and it's typically trans women of color. You, yeah, so you get trans and racism all, all in one, in one. Yeah. and uh, it's really hard to watch. That that has not been improved. It certainly hasn't been solved, and it's getting worse. You still have a lot of places in this country where you can be fired. If you know you can get married, you can get married on Saturday and get fired on Monday. Uh, you can get kicked out of. There's no protection in housing. You can be denied all kinds of things just because you're gay. You're gay, or you're lesbian. You're a, a same-sex couple. Same people can get married or trans or trans or trans. Or trans. Or trans. Yeah. Yeah. But you can get married now as a gay or lesbian couple and still get. A lot of discrimination thrown at you, you know, from many, many angles. That hasn't, that hasn't changed. It, it won't ever change. I mean, I think we'll always be constantly fighting for people's rights and for people to be respected and loved. I mean, I don't, and if you look over, I mean, look at history, we'll be fighting for it, for, for it always. I, I don't think it will ever, it will never end. There's I, always an issue that needs to be rectified or fixed. I hope in 10 years, that will be different, but it's not going to happen without activists yep. and people actually pointing out the discriminations and the horrific actions on a, from a few. Not, it's, not, it's usually not a lot of people. It's just a few who feel empowered to, to exercise their hate. So your work with the HRC and with the Bruce Bastion Foundation, foundation. Mm -hmm. is now the foundation... Is there a foundation with both your names on it? No. Or? Okay. No, no, no. no, no, no. So, um, so your work with the foundations will continue, is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 There's not less need. If anything, there's more. Yeah. So. so let's switch to, you know, this is Mormon stories, right? This is Mormon stories. So we got to talk about Mormonism. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a sin to be gay. Uh, it was evil to be gay. You, Evergreen was around. Mm -hmm. Conversion reparative therapy was kind of the option. Well, it was all was celibacy, mixed orientation marriage, but reparative therapy. Uh, a lot of hate speech against LGBT people in general conference talks mm -hmm. and other things. Uh, the church wouldn't even use the the you know the labels gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Um, they, they still would, won't. They what? I don't think they still do. Not certainly not in conference. 
Right. It's it's, it's there's still problems, but let me just I'll set I'll set up the I'll set up the softball for you to hit it. So okay. um there there's definitely uh um the church liked to reject this idea that there was any biological bases for same sex sexuality. Um, and so you could say a, a lot of things have changed. You could, you know, Evergreen's dead. There's still North Star, but Evergreen's dead. Uh, the church doesn't seem to be overtly backing conversion therapy like it used to. Uh, the church came out with the, uh, you know, gay, what was it, LDS? Uh, Ch- Mormon and gay? Yeah. Right? The Mormon and gay website. The website.com or whatever. They, they, uh, they started to try and say, you know, we don't know what causes it, backing off from saying it's not biological and backing off from saying it's a choice. Um, it seems like they're not, like, targeting same-sex married couples to, like, kick them out of the church like they used to. It, I got the sense that they've backed off of that a little bit. Even the horrible 2015 uh, exclusion policy got rescinded a couple years later. So what if somebody were to say to you, man, it's, it's a great time to be gay and Mormon. And, you know, so what, is there anything you guys want to share? Not, and this isn't to bash the church. This isn't, we're not trying to, you know, attack anyone's no. faith. But uh, same question around the church and the LGBT situation. What, what do you guys have to say about that? Go ahead and start. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for me, because, like, I never really felt like I had a relationship with the church. So I look at it a little bit differently than Bruce. Um, I, I am aware of the issues that, that the church poses when they come out with policies that attacked LGBT community members or their children or, you know, children of same sex couples. Um, I, I think, um, I think they're a business and, they're just doing marketing PR stunts to calm us down or to ignore us for a minute. But I don't, I don't think anything will change in like the Mormon church that will ever allow you to actually be an honest, real Mormon and a gay couple and be gay. So when I mentioned all those changes, I hear you saying all of that's sort of window dressing. What they, what what they haven't changed is what's central. What's central. And they won't, they won't change it. They won't change it because it's, it's, they, they, they feel marriage is between a man and a woman. They'll, that will never, ever change. Like, so central is their belief in the hereafter in the celestial kingdom. And the only way you can get there is through eternal marriage in the temple. And you can only do that as a man and a woman that the, all of God's blessings will never be available to you if you're a same-sex couple. I mean, the church outlawed polygamy. They still practice polygamy in their temple ceremonies. Men can still have multiple wives sealed to them, one at a time. One has, if one, if a woman passes away, he can get married in the temple to a, a second wife or a third wife. Women can't do that. The sisters in can't do that. Uh, the, the, it's just the basic, the basic teachings and beliefs of the hierarchy of the LDS Church has not changed. It's they they try to soften their language and they try to seem more welcoming. And yes, we could we could go to church as a gay couple and we wouldn't be shunned or ostracized. I don't think we'd be have the red carpet rolled out for us either. Uh, it's just, and that's okay. You know, I've I've never fought in all my years as an activist. I have never fought to be able to go back to the Mormon Church as a full, high tier member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saint. I wanted him to get out of my way so I could have the legal civil rights as a human being, as an American who pays taxes, I wanted to be, and lots of them, by the way, (laughs) I wanted to have the same rights as a heterosexual person, Mm -hmm. couple. That's what I've been fighting for. But I don't, so it's not my issue. I personally, down deep, 
I really don't care what the church believes or not believes as far as homosexuality. The only thing I care about is these younger people, kids, who feel that they are less than whole, that there's some part of them that is evil in God's eye, mm -hmm. and that makes them feel uh, alone, hurt, scared, inferior. suicidal, yeah. Yeah, inferior. Broken. Yeah, that's what I don't like. If the church would just stand up, anybody would just say from the pulpit, it's okay to be, be gay. gay. Yep. Not just okay. I bet it's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, well, that, yeah. that would be asking a lot. <laughs> but if they would yeah. just say, you're okay to be gay, it would, that would, well, what that God would change. Wants, what God wants most is for you to be happy, and healthy, and healthy, yeah. fulfilled, and be able to be an authentic human being. There are scriptures that point that out. My favorite one is still, know the truth and the truth will set you free. It took me a long time to just fully engulf that, embrace that of being true in every, in every aspect of my life, but it's true. When I, finally got to, when I finally got to the point where I was authentic, wow, the happiness of heaven poured down upon me. I should write scripture, huh? Um, but it's true. Uh, men are that... They might have. Joy. Man, man is that he might have joy. Okay? That's another one. You can't have joy and live a life of lies. You can't. It's impossible. Um, so I am... I don't want to seem ungrateful. I am so thankful that the church has eased up on a lot of things in the last 10 years. And I am very thankful, and I know it has helped tens of thousands of people. But would I say that LDS Church is gay-friendly? Probably not. So as I, as I kind of think about this a little bit, here's how I think about it, and I'm restating some of the things that you said. So yes, Evergreen's gone. Yes, conversion therapy isn't promoted mm -hmm. overtly. Um, but at the very, very core, a young Latter-day Saint LGBTQ person feels broken, feels inadequate, does not feel whole, uh, does not feel like they are embraced and loved and celebrated as they are in the sight of God and their heavenly parents. So you can create all the websites you want. You can even work with the Utah legislature and pass some, some legislation here and there. You can have lots of PR statements that say, we love everyone, and, and you can even ease off some of the rhetoric. But if those LGBT youth and, and children and adults don't feel at their core, like number one, their heavenly parents adore them as they are, mm -hmm. that they're whole and perfect and beautiful as they are, then you've, you've done relatively nothing. Relatively without nothing. Without there, starting mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but that's just the beginning, because what we've heard from today's interview is how transformative it's been for both of you to be able to love who you want to love and build a life with them. Mm -hmm. So to say, okay, you're not evil, LGBTQ people, but don't you dare fall in love with and marry who you really love. Either just suck it up and have a life of loneliness for the rest of your life as a celibate person. Try that straight people before you tell yeah. LGBT people try to it. live that way. Try that. It's deadly. My research shows that. Living a celibate life is toxic, if not deadly. And then secondly, um, okay, if you, if you can't be celibate, marry someone you're not attracted to and try and build a life with someone that you're not fundamentally attracted to, but somehow make that work, which is also, for deadly. many, a very toxic lifestyle. So if, if people aren't celebrated for who they are at their core, if they're not allowed to love and be with who they want to be with, and then if there's no 
theology, if there's no plan of salvation, if all this stuff about God and Jesus and the atonement and the afterlife, that's for those straight people. You ain't got no path if you're going to live that authentic life. There's no path for you. Then what have you done? The way, all the websites in the world, all the PR statements, legislative acts here and there to just kind of like, it's all window dressing. It doesn't strike at what's transformatively meaningful. And it, and it really comes to your beautiful story about how, well, Clint, you didn't even see a life for yourself because yeah. in the church you were raised, there was, they there, had there no is, place there is for no you. Place they had for no me. vision for yep. you. So you had no vision for yourself. Yep. And even as you two are fighting for marriage for other people, you didn't see that as ever being a part of your us, yeah. life. No. And yet for you, what you're saying is that your marriage has been transformational. Oh, yeah. So yeah. until the church yes. gives people that, they've done nothing. Okay, sorry. That's my soapbox. <laughs> Tell me if you agree or not or what I missed. No, it, it's, I think it's you're spot on. <laughs> um, you, have to have, you have to have hope in this life. And, and it's, just, it's not just the LDS church. It's, it's almost all religions. There are a few exceptions. But they don't. They don't want you to be authentic, or they they preach against authenticity. They want you to follow what you're told, what you're preached about, and and that that might get in the way of who you really are. If you're lucky enough to fit into that box, great, and you are indeed very lucky. Um, if you're not, you will never really attain eternal happiness. And I think it also, I mean, that whole battle, that inner battle, or however you want to call it, it, it really leads to people losing their testimonies because they, you know, why, I don't think being a Mormon is a, a good, practicing, faithful Mormon. I don't think it's easy. I just don't. Maybe it's easy for some people. But... You know, you and you, when you're fighting this battle and you don't have any hope of it out of the outcome being happy, you just give up fighting the battle, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. You leave the church, you estrange yourself from your family, or worst case scenario, you commit suicide. Yeah. So, it's there's just no reason keep this sham going. I will say that maybe the, <clears throat> the fluff and the websites and them kind of soft being calmer towards us or not, not as harsh on us has given the members an ability to loosen up their opinions and open up their minds. And it's given the members a way to say, okay, maybe, maybe this isn't okay. Maybe this is okay. But I think, them, you know, like the thing they did in 2015 was kind of damning for like children, but it gave the members an opportunity to start looking at things differently, if that makes sense. And I think that opened up a lot of hearts in, in Mormon families, especially those who have a member of the LGBTQ community in their family. Um, I think it's kind of, it has helped, but it, but it, but it's not to the point where um, you're celebrated and encouraged to live a, a LGBTQ life or whatever. Does that make sense? Like, it, it makes all sense. Because uh, I've noticed in a lot of my interactions with family and friends who are, you know, belong to the church, they have a lighter understanding or, or softer spot in their hearts for us now than they did eight years ago, I would think. Yeah, and that's the part I, I didn't mention, but it's crucial. We know from the research of Caitlin Ryan and the Family Acceptance Project that when an LGBT youth or young adult feels highly rejected by their family, they're um, you know three times more likely to uh, engage in risky sexual behavior, three times more likely to engage in illegal drug use, and sometimes up to eight times as likely to attempt suicide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's whether, it's, it's, it's what you just said, yeah. Clint, it's whether the family rejects you. And I think we have to give the church at least a tiny bit of credit. 
I think there's maybe probably less rejection of LGBT people than there used to be within yeah. Mormonism. Yes. Well, yes. And they opened yes. up. The, they opened up the dialogue. That because of what they because of their stances on it, they brought in that conversation to the dining room table to dinner. Families are now talking about it. Which before, like with my issue, it was just no, you're not. Don't talk about it. Don't bring it up. Keep your head down. Do what's right. We we never talked about gay issues in my in my family ever. And we, I, we're starting to now, but I think because the church has talked about it recently, families are now talking about it, which I think is a a good thing. You need to talk about it. it. It's a great thing, and and I really appreciate the church opening that dialogue. I wouldn't have the relationship I have with my chis- my children and grandchildren had they not said it's okay to talk about it. So are you gonna are you gonna thank the church for making some progress? I will thank I the church. So, yeah. I will thank the church <laughs> for making progress, and it's 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 in some ways quite significant. I am not going to give them a pass though <laughs> on to be able to stand up and say we love our how do they say it? We love our our gay brothers and sisters. Same sex attracted. Our same se- <laughs> we love our same sex attracted brothers and sisters. No. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. You're getting there. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're getting it's, there. It's good. I mean, maybe them bringing it up and stuff may have backfired a little bit for them because yeah. people are like, oh, I don't know if I can really support this, and especially when they're children. <clears throat> Some people, when their children come out and they, and they just can't, they just can't be okay with it. You know, it's just, yeah. So tell me, tell me if, oh, go ahead, Bruce. Were you oh, going to say something? I was going to say yes. So Pro- tell me if this progress, is Progress, but not finality. Progress, but a long way to go. Yeah. Let me, let's just, let's, I know they're watching. Hi, guys. Uh, we have a roadmap for you. And we're going to do that today on our interview with, with Bruce and Clint. Here's the roadmap. Just four little things we want for LGBT brothers and sisters. We want them to feel like they're perfect as they are. Mm -hmm. 100% loved and perfect. Number two, we want them to be able to love who they want to love. Yes. And marry who they want to marry. Yes. And um, three, we want them to have a plan, a part in the plan of the plan of salvation. If there's going to be a plan of salvation, let it it include them. If there is an afterlife, (laughs) the afterlife has to include (laughs) them. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to have the afterlife include, don't make it so that they want to feel like the only way they can be happy is once they die because there's no happiness for them in this life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the fourth thing is, is have it be so that family members don't just like tolerate or accept or don't reject them. Have it be such that not only them as individuals, but their relationships mm-hmm. are celebrated yep. as outstandingly awesome, not as like unfortunate Sad, substandard, mm-hmm. sad mm-hmm. relationships. Those are the four things. And I want to, and I want right? to, I, I want to give a huge shout out to my kids because they do. They they celebrate our relationship. They are happy and excited about our relationship, and that, and they're all good Mormons. So that means a lot to you, Bruce. It means a, oh yeah, a ton, yeah, yeah. And Clint, you have some support in, on your family? No, side? yeah, my siblings are great. They are they are, are are very great. We've had a different my the journey with my family has been different with the journey with Bruce and his children. Um, my my family has been very supportive. They came to the wedding, um, but yeah, I, and I appreciate that. I I think it's great, and it means a lot to me. And I imagine if the church makes progress, it helps with your family. Yeah, right? yeah. It helps your family make continued progress. Yep. So we'll hope for that. Still good changes to come. Yeah. 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 And talking about this, this interview today um, is, part, is going to be part of that process. Yeah. Yeah. Change comes from within, I believe. Mm. And, and that's an, an individual, an organization, a church, a company. Real change comes from within. Yeah. Yep. So to kind of wrap things up, um, there's... Teenage Clint, there's young adult Clint, there's teenage Bruce, there's young adult Bruce. There are all these, uh, you know, gay Mormon boys and young men and men, all these lesbian, uh, you know, Mormon girls and young women and women. They're trans Mormons. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or there's those same groups of people that have kind of 
are starting to say, maybe Mormonism isn't for me, or maybe they left Mormonism behind. If you were going to speak to those people now to give them some sort of parting words of wisdom, and in some ways you're speaking to your younger selves, right? Yeah, yeah. From the vantage point now of where you are, where you're, you're, you're feeling very healthy, you're in a relationship that you love, you're married, but they're like, that seems so far away. How do I even get there? Now, now you can be the role models for people, and everyone's going to have their own journey. But now you are standing as, as sort of models for, hey, you, here's something you can work for if mm -hmm. you want to. If you want to, yeah. If you want to, look, we're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing it. Yeah, so I, that's what's, for me, that's what's most powerful for this interview, is you're basically saying you can find health. You yep. can heal, and you can find love. So for that kid or that teen or that young adult that's like, but how do I get there? Parting words of wisdom from each of you. Let's start. I would say be patient. Be very, very patient because it's a process. It's not something you can just do overnight. And make sure you build a strong foundation of friends or family um, to fall back on when things get hard. And make sure they're the right people that have the same standards as you so that when you do fall back and things are hard, you're not getting involved in things you shouldn't be getting into. That's what I, be I mean. Patient. And be patient. My whole thing is be patient. It gets, life does get better, I promise. It gets better. It does. Yeah, and it so does. don't lose hope. Yeah, saying. don't lose hope. Yeah. yeah. Bruce? Uh, to the Mormon kid, uh, part of the Godhead is the uh, Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost talks to you. The Holy Ghost doesn't tell someone else, not even your bishop, not even a uh, general authority parent. parent. The Holy Ghost is your link to God. Listen to that Holy Ghost. When you, when you pray, don't pray for a specific answer. Open your heart. Open your mind. Be who you are. Be who you are. Be honest about who you are. And the other thing of Mormon doctrine is freedom of choice. Remember that who you are and who you become is up to you. It's not for anyone to dictate, not your parents, not the bishop, no one. So follow your own heart, your own, that, own, that, that voice in your own head, and know that that decision is yours to make. And when you make it, hold your head up high mm -hmm. and make it. And I wish, you know... Don't be afraid. I know that's easy to say and not always easy to do. Don't be afraid. Uh, have the courage and the will to be your authentic self. Mm -hmm. yep. You said it much better than me. <laughs> no. 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 So I just want to say, um, uh, I just want to say thank you. I want to say Thank you, you know, Bruce, for your philanthropy and activism over the years. You were an important part of my journey uh, from the 90s on in tearing down my homophobia and bigotry, which I'm you know, always going to be working on. But you were an early voice that woke me up, but, but even more so your efforts at philanthropy and activism have enhanced the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not more people in Utah and across the country. And it's inspired me and it's meant a lot to me. Um, you know, I have people in my life that have directly benefited from the work that you've done uh, unselfishly and with a desire uh, to save lives and improve the quality of lives. So I wanna thank you for that. Bruce. Thank you. I appreciate that's really it's really nice to hear. Seriously, it's very nice. And I'm not done. Um, Bruce and Clint, thank you so much for being willing to tell your story. It's not easy to tell your story, especially in Utah and in the Mormon culture, because people don't understand, people are defensive, people are afraid. But that that little gay kid or that little gay girl or those young adults or trans adults or 
they need to see that there's hope. And they need to see role models. And the only way they see that is when people speak up and tell their story and say, I got healthy. And we found each other. And health and love is possible. I think that's what most people want, mm -hmm. is health and love. Yeah. And thank you both for being willing to tell your story and be that spark of hope for new generations. Thank you. Thank you for allowing yeah. us to tell yeah, our story. Thank you. thank you for giving us a platform and, yeah. and, and many other people a platform to tell their stories. Yeah. And you don't inspire me as gay men and as a gay couple. You inspire me as human beings and as two people who love each other. Thanks. Thank you. That's Thanks. really what it's about. You shouldn't have these subclasses. Yeah, right? your, your love and your courage and your growth is inspiring. Thanks. Thank you. And your philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This has been really great. Yes, it has. So all of you watching, so next time I'm going to interview John <laughs> about how his life has changed in the last 10 years because it really has. <laughs> and uh, I'll just leave it at that. For <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. That would be really yeah. fun. Yeah. You both can interview me. Yeah, okay. I would do Perfect. that. Perfect, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Mormon Stories listeners, thanks for joining us today. This has been super fun. Huge shout out to Gerardo, who's been helping me in the back with the audio and the video. And all this amazing cinematography and lighting has been Gerardo's contribution to the Open Stories Foundation of Mormon Stories. So huge thanks to Gerardo. Huge thanks to, to Bruce and Clint. Thanks to all of you who support Mormon Stories. Uh, it's been sketchy during the COVID time in terms of like wondering if we're going to be here next year or the year after. Uh, we have had some of you step up to help kind of plug those holes. So thank you for everyone who stepped in to make uh, what we do possible. Please do consider donations to Mormon Stories. You can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly subscriber. Um, Bruce has been very generous and supportive of us uh, historically, and thank you, Bruce. But we always need your support. So if you appreciate the cinematography, the lighting, these wonderful stories, the ability to throw Gerardo a bone for his help, um, we need your support. So please do donate. Uh, your, donates make a dif your donations make a difference. We really are transforming uh, the lives of, of many people that need it. And it's because of your generosity. So thanks for your support. Please continue it. Check out our new YouTube channel, Understanding Mormonism. We've got three videos up. One's coming. We've got a lot to go. Uh, we really want you to subscribe to that channel. Let other people know. The idea is just little short 10-minute videos uh, that talk about different areas of Mormonism that you can share with family and friends that can go viral. That's very, very different from what we've done in the past, which are 5 or 10 or 15-hour interviews. Um, so check out Understanding Mormonism. Thanks for your support on that as well. And uh, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com with any questions or comments. Please feel free to leave positive, uplifting, supportive comments uh, on this blog post when it goes up. I'm sure Bruce and Clint would love to hear from you. If you have words of thanks or encouragement or support, uh, we'd love to hear it. If you have ideas on future guests or topics, we'd love to hear that as well. And just uh, let's keep doing great and beautiful things. We've got 15 years of Mormon stories in the bag. Let's do at least 15 to 20, 25 more in the future because there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Is that there are a lot say? of great stories yeah, a out lot there. Of great stories. Yeah. A lot of great stories. Yep. So thanks, guys. Thank, thanks, Gerardo. Thanks, all of you. And we'll see you again soon on Mormon Story Podcast where these guys interview me someday. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs>